Welcome everyone. Again, my name is Lisa Mooney and I am a business relationship manager with Bank United and I will be acting as the moderator today for our presentation, which is real estate and the new normal. I am honored to be joined by two experts in the field of real estate who will be discussing the impacts of COVID on the real estate industry. So you're going to hear a lot of information today, which I, I'm sure you will find informative. Before I introduce our speakers, I would like to encourage all of you to post any questions in the chat, uh, and we will try to answer as many of those questions as we can towards the end of the presentation. Today, we have with us Roy Oppenheim, co-founder and senior partner of Oppenheim and Pulaski PA, which he co-founded 32 years ago. Roy's practice focuses on commercial and residential real estate, real estate litigation, and he assists clients both nationally and internationally. Roy is also the co-founder and vice president of Weston Title and Escrow, the oldest title company in the city of Weston, and has worked with prominent developers in South Florida, such as Arvida, Windmill Reserve, and, and Landmark Ranch Estates. Roy is joined by Ken Morris, president of Morris Southeast Group. And uh, Roy, I'll let you introduce Ken, if you don't mind. Great. Well, first of all, I, I want to thank you and, of course, Bank United and, and Aris for, for hosting us today. Uh, you know, I think it's, it's just a great opportunity to continue what Ken and I had previously uh, been doing when we were doing our Zooms at noon, where during the, the, the height of the pandemic, we would meet, basically have a, a seminar like this every week uh, for 33 weeks in a row. And now that the things are changing and evolving, uh, this gives us a chance to catch up and see what we suggested may have been right or what was wrong and, and, and to prognosticate in the future. Ken uh, has been a broker uh, for 30 years. He's with, uh, the, the, with, with, with uh, Morris Southeast Group. It, it, it's a family business that, that his father started. He's continued it. We've had a business relationship with Ken for almost that entire period of time. And if, and if, there, if anyone knows uh, West Broward and Broward County real estate, it's, it's, it's Ken Moore, especially on the commercial side. So he's going to be perfect to really discuss with us today what's going on in the, uh, in the real estate market. Thank you. Great. Okay. All right. So um, Ken, would you like to um, say a few words uh, before we get started? Uh, only to say thanks to uh, Roy and Bank United for having me uh, come and talk about the market. I'm excited. It's always fun to get together with Roy and talk about what's going on in the general economy and then sort of filter it down to uh, at a granular level what's going on with, with real estate here in the Southeast Florida market. So uh, I look forward to getting started. Okay. All right. With that, Roy, um, we'll turn it over to you to start our presentation. Great. So today we're going to talk about the new normal in real estate and the impact of COVID-19 effectively uh, a year later. I mean, just last March, you know, uh, was the last time that we actually physically convened as a society, really, as, you know, going to meetings and going to happy hours. And that's now all quickly changing. In fact, I'm at a meeting right now up in Orlando. It's the first time I've been in a conference room in over, over a year. Our firm had our first happy hour last night for our staff. So things are starting to evolve. It was outside, though. Uh, and so I, I think a lot has changed. A lot's going to try and go back to the way it was, but, but things never go back to, to the way they are. And that's why we're calling it the new normal. So Ken and I are going to walk you through, with Lisa's help, uh, the different segments of real estate and, and how uh, this past year is going to impact real estate and society for some time to come. And in order to do that, we have to do two things. First, we have to go to the next slide, Lisa. We have to go to uh, look at generally what's going on in the economy, and then uh, we want to see how that impacts uh, real estate in general. Next slide, economic update, slide four. Here we go. Uh, the gross domestic product, which is one way that we, we measure the economy, we can see ha has grown from 2010 up through the V. And if Lisa, if, if you can take your pointer, you can go to what happened in, in effectively March uh, 2020. And we see this huge decline in 2020 of, 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 the, uh, of the V. And I want to make my page bigger so I can see this too. Okay. And so we've seen a, a huge decline. And then very quickly in the past several months, we've seen ourselves get almost back to where we were pre-pandemic in terms of the economy, but it doesn't come back the way it left. So 
goods, obviously, if we look on the right, has had a tremendous impact. And so, so there's so much more going on online. And we're looking at uh, the, the sales from different stores right now that are coming through. We're seeing that, you know, besides Amazon and, and, and Home Depot and Lowe's, we're seeing that there's been just an enormous amount of, of consumption in those areas. And why? Because people are buying online and they're also focusing on, on fixing up their homes. And so we see that, we see services have done okay. But if we look at the bottom, you know, housing has done okay. Government spending is starting to pick up. Business investment has, has lagged. But what we're seeing is that the economy is almost back to where it was pre-pandemic, but it's going to be a K-shaped recovery. Not everyone's gonna share in that benefit. So we have to figure out who the winners are, who the losers are. And in real estate, it's K-shaped too, because there are winners and losers in the K-shape. Uh, Ken, do you wanna chime in? Yeah, one of the things that, that I want us to all to remember or keep in mind is that, you know, yes, things have recovered dramatically since last March, but it's a distorted environment. There is so much stimulus money that's filtering through the system right now. It's kind of hard to know where true recovery is and where the boost is from uh, the stimulus. So I think we need a little more time to really figure out you know, what is true recovery and where are we really back to where we were before or how much of it is a stimulus effect. So it'd be interesting to see how that is. I don't think we, we're really at that point. We have enough, we don't have enough time to, to really figure that out yet, but it's gonna be interesting to see the next few quarters, what, uh, what growth looks like. And there's a lot of distortion that's going on. You have an unusual amount of money that's been pumped into the economy by, by the government. And you also have these moratoriums, these rental moratoriums, foreclosure moratoriums, and those all distort what's really going on in the economy. And so as those situations change, they will all have impact on the real estate. So for example, let's go to slide five, Lisa. Let's look at, let's look at employment or unemployment. We saw that unemployment rose to almost 15% in May, 2020. That's the top of the chart. And then it very quickly slid back in March, 2021 to below 5%. And if you go out to April or May, we're probably at the same point that we were on January 2020, which is kind of interesting because how do restaurants get their, 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 their staff back? How do hotels get their staff back if we're close to you know, a 3% unemployment rate? And the people who are unemployed right now are collecting unemployment and maybe aren't sufficiently motivated to come back. So you, know, you saw articles in the Sun Sentinel just last week where restaurants had to curtail their hours. Maybe they closed for an extra day. They'd have to shorten their hours because they didn't have enough staff and their staff was, was working too many hours uh, to actually fulfill all the roles, whether it's someone to wash the dishes or, or a chef or to serve. There aren't enough people right now to help with this economic rebound. So that's gonna have an impact also on, on, on different types of real estate. Next slide, please. Uh, if we talk about the K-shaped economy, uh, what we're seeing here is that unemployment uh, has affected different areas more than others. So if we look at the top, we see mining, quarrying, leisure and hospitality are all at the top. And at the bottom, government workers, they weren't affected. Financial activities weren't affected. Education and health service workers weren't affected. And you have the, the, the folks in between. But it shows that, that when you talk about a K-shaped economy, if we look at the K, we have the, the stick and then we have the part that goes up to the right. The part that goes up to the right are the people who have actually benefited or haven't been harmed by the economy. And then you have the folks on the bottom who can't work from home have to you know, uh, actually go out. Uh, and more importantly, uh, are folks that um, are maybe on, on a moratorium on their mortgage or on their lease and may not have the, the income necessarily to bring back their, their, their loans or, or to clear up the back rents when those moratorium ends. Ken, you want to chime in again? No, I think that, uh, that, that covers it. Roy, um, I have a question uh, that um, was asked. Uh, going forward or now, after COVID and uh, say for the next three months to, to through the end of the year, what industries do you anticipate will probably experience the highest growth? I think that's a great question. And that gets us to a next slide. Uh, and we're gonna talk about its impact on, uh, on South Florida and what industries are obviously gonna be uh, benefited or, or not benefited. So, so Ken, do you wanna first talk about which industries uh, I guess you, let's go to slide. Yeah, slide eight. Very good. Uh, are are going to you know be positively impacted in the next three months? We've talked about this a lot. Well, I think that restaurants are going to recover. Uh, people can't wait to get out and eat. Uh, for the most part, I think that the ones that were weaker have failed uh, or are on the edge of failing. Uh, there's a whole new entrepreneurial set of 
restaurateurs that want to come in and take advantage of existing infrastructure, you know, uh, kitchens are very expensive to build, grease traps and so forth. It hoods, the whole infrastructure to build a restaurant is very, very expensive. So I think that a lot of the vacant restaurant spaces are going to get relet very quickly. Uh, and I think employment will return, you know, over the next, you know, the next few months uh, into that sector as the pandemic wanes and more people are uh, inoculated and uh, are feeling comfortable to get out. Well, I mean, the South Florida economy is tied very much to travel. And of course, there's not much international travel yet uh, from Europe or China or Asia, but there is starting to be more travel from South America and Central America. Uh, the cruise industry is still not operative, but it's just a matter of weeks or a few months before they are. And that, of course, has a ripple effect because then they, they, people fly in, they stay an extra night or two or sometimes several days in South Florida. South Florida becomes a, a stop, either a first stop, last stop, or a middle stop for, for a cruise. And so it, it'll have a major impact on all the vendors and the entire economy uh, once those industries kick back in. In terms of events, uh, obviously, weddings and bar mitzvahs, our event planners are, are telling us how, you know, what we used to only have a, maybe a, a Friday, a Saturday, a Sunday wedding. Now you have a Thursday wedding, a Monday wedding, Tuesday and Wednesday weddings, not so as much yet, but, but, but they're coming also. And, and so anyone who has venues or, or is planning events, they are exceptionally, exceptionally busy. Large corporate events, they're not on the books for 2020. Uh, they'll probably be on the books for 2021. There are a few uh, conferences or seminars that are, that are going to be going on, but the bulk of it's probably going to go in 2021, in part because corporations didn't budget a lot of, of that kind of budgeting in their budgets in 2020 for 2021. But in 2021, those budgets will come back for that, that kind of travel. But it won't be necessarily the sales travel where everyone just shows up and is in your face. It'll probably be more when there are big meetings and people come together. And that's going to have an impact on, on, on hotels, on restaurants, on, and, and have a ripple effect through, through the entire economy. You know, when we talk about retail, I, and, and Lisa and, and Ken, I talked about this a few days ago, you know, my dry cleaner has cut back his hours, my shoe, my shoemaker's out of business. People aren't wearing the same kind of clothing. Um, you know, athleisure wear is taking over to almost being a 24 seven kind of, kind of apparel that doesn't require dry cleaning. People wearing more sneakers, those shoes don't, don't have heels that, that, that fall off and have to be repaired. And so it's gonna change the, the, the definition of retail. And so uh, let, let's get deeper into this as, if, if, if we can. Um, let me see, we, 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 there's some points here you all could take a look at, we'll, we'll, we'll keep moving. But let's talk about retail and malls, Ken. Let's talk about which malls are gonna do well and which ones aren't on page nine. Yeah, I think the, the, uh, the enclosed malls are, are pretty much of a dead model down here and in the Sun Belt, maybe up in the northern climes where you still get, you know, super cold conditions for several months at a time, you'll still see some enclosed malls. But for the most part, uh, many of the, the enclosed malls like your Broward Mall and other malls like it, uh, even Sawgrass Mills, they're just not seeing the foot traffic. Uh, the quality of the retailer that's inside, you know, has gone down. I'm going I'm gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt you on that. For, for purposes of the seminar, Ellen and I actually went to the Sawgrass Mills Mall Monday afternoon evening. And there are two things we found fascinating. Number one, couldn't find a parking space. We thought it was the day before Thanksgiving, number one. Number two, the stores, many of them had to close early. And why are they closing early? And this is where it comes back to what I said. They don't Employees. have enough personnel to stay open. It's just a fact. And, right. um, and a lot of their trap people who were coming were from South and Central America because they were coming to the United States. And this is fascinating to get a free vaccine. And they preferred the J&J &J vaccine so they wouldn't have to come back twice. But there were some people who wanted to come back twice so they could go shopping twice and bring back stuff home twice. So just tell you how the vaccines are actually a major part of the South Florida economy right now. It's just absolutely fascinating. Can't make this stuff up. Uh, but the reality is people are used to having stuff delivered from home. It's faster. If you don't like it, you can return it. It's more convenient. That The Amazon impact is not going to change post-COVID. Having your meals delivered at home after you've, you've done something and worked out or, 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 or have been busy and don't want to cook a meal, instead of having to go out, having DoorDash deliver it, yeah, maybe you'll go out a little bit more. But the reality is, is that DoorDash and 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 Grubhub and, and you know, Uber Eats, those are all here to stay. And, and that has been a major change because while those uh, services existed, they weren't common household names as they are today. And so that's kind of an interesting issue. 
And then uh, in terms of movie theaters, which are using anchors from major retail establishments, uh, you have uh, movies that instead of, you know, first going to a movie theater and then going out, you know, to uh, a streamer like Netflix will actually go directly to a streamer first or may go to both at the same time. And how the tail wags the dog, it's interesting how Netflix is now going to give movies to the movie theaters for one week before they actually release it on Netflix. I mean, the world in some ways has turned upside down and that's not going to change post pandemic. And so when you're looking at real estate, you have to say what has changed uh, in terms of whether you're an investor, a developer, or a tenant, an owner, you have to ask yourself, what has changed in, in the social dynamic and the fabric of, of our country in this, in this past year? Uh, look, we can go to slide 10 and we'll talk about industrial warehouse, which is your sweet spot, Ken, go for it. Well, industrial is booming. Uh, not just here in South Florida, but booming all over the country. Uh, as you said, the demand for goods is just increasing dramatically. Um, there's been a supply chain issue uh, that's slowly working through uh, resolution now. I think there's going to be more onshoring of some manufacturing and uh, distribution of uh, goods that are that we're getting from overseas. However, the boom that's in construction for a warehouse right now, at least locally, is in the five to seven million range square feet of new properties already under construction in this market. The vacancy rate is slightly going up to around five and a half, six percent for industrial, but also rental rates are skyrocketing higher. The average rental rate for a brand new distribution space is north of $13 a square foot. And this is for the 32 to 36 foot clear. There's also some new warehouses that are going multi-story, meaning multi-story warehouses that are gonna be five and six and seven stories high. And you're seeing a dramatic uh, uh, increase in demand. So the vacancy rates, I think, while we're seeing a slight uptick because of the new product, I also think that demand's gonna keep up with it for quite some time. With that and said- the Ken, I have a question. The yeah. multi-stories, do they use elevators or, or, or they have ramp, ramps, kind of like a, like, like a garage? Ramps. Uh, they have ramps that, uh, that the 18-wheel trucks can go up and have turning right. radius and so Fantastic. forth. We're not, we're not seeing it so much here yet, but it's coming. Remember, land is not being made any longer here in South Florida. It's not like we're a big, wide-open place like Dallas-Fort Worth, where there's still millions and millions of acres that you can continue to expand into forever. Here we're constrained between the Everglades and the Atlantic Ocean. And we're starting to see now non-performing retail centers and non-performing office buildings get scraped for a new product. Right now, most of it has been multifamily, but we're starting to see that redevelopment now for industrial because the demand pattern is there. That last mile distribution is, you know, when everybody's expecting to get make an order at nine and get a delivery by two, you have to have a warehouse to store all that product. So it's, it's absolutely uh, on fire right now. And on the prices that are being paid for a warehouse, on average, it was around 150, 160 a foot. But right now, because this market is so heated and so frothy, there are buyers coming into this market, institutional buyers that are paying 185 to 190 a square foot for brand new vacant shell warehouse because they want to participate in this market, which means their returns are going to be sub 5%. That's just amazing. We haven't seen that kind of dynamic here uh, in, in this part of the country. And we are right now the it market for the United States. Everybody wants to deploy capital down here especially in industrial. So let's talk a little bit about the impact of migration in terms of what's happening from New York and its impact really on the entire, on all the sectors of, of real estate, whether it's a industrial warehouse, office, and of course, residential. Uh, I mean, what we're seeing is, is that either because of the tax rates, because of the weather, uh, because you're outside more in Florida. I mean, you're just outside more. You're, you know, you're outside maybe eight, nine months, 10 months of the year in Florida. While up north, you know, you may be outside if you're lucky, six months, maybe seven months. But I mean, it's a it's a, it's a big big difference. And so, being outside that much more, people find uh, South Florida to be that much more attractive. And with that, 
uh, people are going to be shopping more, they're going to be spending more, and you need more warehouses. I mean, it just, it's just a trickle effect. And of course, that, that helps retail. And of course, it helps office at, at the same time, too, even though a lot of people are going to be working from home. So, so it has a tr probably the biggest impact on the residential high high end residential market. Um, and I think we have to go to the next slide, right? Um, right there we go. Or, yes, yeah, there we go. Thank you. All right, great. Um, did we hit all these points? Here? I think we did. Yes. Oh, right. One of the things I wanted to mention on retail is kind of interesting. Uh, you know, we were also down on Lincoln Road, Ellen and I, a few weeks ago, and, and we had early on in this uh, pandemic, we had talked about that as many as maybe a third of all retail businesses would end up not making it. And it's kind of interesting because in some places there was nominal impact. In some places it was just certain kinds of categories, maybe like the shoemaker and, and the dry cleaner having to cut back. But on Lincoln Road, we saw maybe 25 or 30 percent of the local shops did not make it. Even some of the chains didn't make it. And, and the reason for that is that particular area required conventioneers, that particular area required people from the cruise industry, and it required tourists. So yeah, locals did go to tourists, you know, go to Lincoln Road, but maybe half, if not three quarters of their real business was coming from people who were visiting, you know, uh, Miami Beach and South Beach. And so that is where you have that, that, that ripple effect. In New York City, you cut, in New York City, you have the same same impact. Certain neighborhoods have been devastated, like Times Square and, and Midtown, where people come to work every day and then now not coming to work. So that ebb and flow that you don't have of people arriving, grabbing a bagel, grabbing a pretzel, having a hot dog, all those folks were, were been clobbered because you don't have the people coming to the, the buildings and then going for lunch, going home, grabbing a drink with a buddy before they got on the train. All those flows have have changed, and so that that just changes the dynamics. But, but restaurants in the in the boroughs, whether it's in Brooklyn or in or in in uh, different neighborhoods in Manhattan that are more residential, those retail operations, those kinds of restaurants, have done very well. And when some when one went out, another one popped in. And so I think we're seeing that also. Where in the burbs in in South Florida and up in Palm Beach, things things have been fine. But where places were were really tied to tourism or 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 to to conventions or to the cruise industry, that's where you had maybe not 30%, but maybe 50%. So it wasn't like, oh, across the board, it was 30%. You just had veins of, of folks who were successful and veins of folks who weren't able to overcome it because of who their, their clientele was. And so you have that K-shaped again of winners and losers. Um, okay, let's go to, uh, we're, we're on page 12, I think, right? We're South Florida Industrial Market Q1, is that right? Ken, are we there? Yeah, yes. uh, we've already talked about yeah. uh, the vacancy rates and, and absorption, um, positive absorption, uh, a tremendous amount of new product coming in uh, on the market at any other time, I would say it would be worrisome, but uh, I think for the time being, the demand pattern is going to be very strong. And remember, we're still getting about a thousand people a day moving into the state of Florida, not all of them down here, but figure a third of them are moving down here every day. So figure 300 plus or minus new people a day moving into our market means that the demand for, for goods and services is going to continue to climb. This is forecast to go on for many, many more years. Uh, I, mean, I mean, Florida is now the third largest state after California and Texas. Uh, in New York, you know, they're saying that they're losing population and that's really not, not the case. What's happening in New York is that People are leaving, the folks who are leaving are generally older and they may be well-established, more well-established. They're looking for, for places to go where, where they won't be hit as much with state taxes. And then you have new people moving in who are younger, who are looking to build their careers, are looking for the excitement of the city. And, and so you have this, this kind of uh, shedding that's going on where the city is reinventing itself, re, 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 rebuilding itself, rebranding itself as a more youthful, more exciting place where, where folks are eating outside, streets are, but don't have as many vehicles, there's more pedestrian traffic, much more of a European feel. So, so you, you're, you're getting these changes and, and things aren't gonna change back post pandemic the way the city was. Just like down here, uh, when a mall dies, it doesn't get replaced by, by another mall. When a movie theater dies, it doesn't get replaced by another movie theater. These things are gonna get repositioned, reused, and, and they're going to be for a highest and best use. And a lot of times the highest and best use is something that we may not yet even have, have con fully conceived of yet. And, and can, we can talk about some, some repositioning uh, that, that you, you anticipate uh, in the economy going, going forward. Uh, um, another question, I know you mentioned uh, the industrial warehouse. One of the um, in demand is refrigeration. 
Does that have to do with the ghost kitchens uh, that's going on? I know we're hearing more and more of that. That's a great question, Lisa. Uh, it, many of you may or may not know what a ghost kitchen is, but with the, the advent of these food delivery companies that were helping restaurants deliver their food, some folks said, screw the restaurant, screw serving people. Let's not worry about you know having tables and linens. Let's just have a home delivery food service. So you didn't need to have a retail operation with expensive rent. You could have a warehouse where you could actually have a kitchen and you could prepare your food and then have it delivered by one of the delivery services. And so I don't know if you necessarily would need much, you would need some refrigeration, but I don't know if the whole building needs to be refrigerated. Ken, you'd, you'd know more about that than me. Yeah, the whole building would need it, but, but refrigeration is definitely uh, in demand down here if it's well located and we're getting more uh, fruits and vegetables from South America coming directly to the Miami area as opposed to being bypassing Miami on the, on the ships and going up to uh, New Jersey and Pennsylvania to be treated. Now we're, we're allowed in some facilities down here to treat the fruits and vegetables so they stay here. And that saves a tremendous amount of money on, on trucking costs. And it, it saves our, you know, it saves on so many levels, fuel, trucking, storage, et cetera, et cetera. So we do a lot more of that cold storage. You're gonna see more of that in demand and more of it developed here in, in Southeast Florida, especially in the airport West area by Miami International. And there's also a new cargo uh, airport that is planned for just south of Lake Okeechobee. And the question is whether it's gonna be fully approved. I've heard that it was gonna be approved, but that the whole purpose of that airport is to be cargo only to take the pressure off of Miami International and Fort Lauderdale, which have a tremendous amount of cargo flowing through. It's just, they can't handle the capacity. So our ports are gonna to continue to uh, uh, increase in size and we're gonna get more of that, you know, the. The, the, the fruits and vegetables coming into and our besides market. and besides fruits and vegetables you also have uh flowers exotic flowers from central yeah. and south america yeah uh, medicine. And you also, and you medical also have, equipment right you have the, all the pharma that's correct there's, there's a whole there's a lot of pharmaceuticals that need to be kept at a certain temperature in fact there's some lawsuits out there right now i think zantac and some of their their affiliated uh types of uh, antacid companies uh where they were delivering uh meds that weren't at the right temperature and, and, and chemical reactions would occur. And that could have all have been avoided if, if uh, they had been stored and delivered using refrigerated trucks and refrigerated storage. And so there's a huge demand for that, that segment that, that I think is un, unsatisfied right now. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, next slide, Lisa. Thank you. Office. So I, I think office space is a function of uh, how, you know, why we go to the office, uh, and who goes to the office, when we go to the office, and what we want to do when we go to the office. And so a lot of folks um, may not necessarily want to go back to the office. There are some people who like working from home, but they may not want to work from home every day. They may not want to work from home five days a week. They may not want to go to the office five days a week. So you're going to see a lot of hybrid models. And this is a fascinating picture on the left. This is an apartment building somewhere in California, in Monrovia, California, where the apartment building has built as part of the common area, little office suites for, for the people who live in the building who have to, who would like to work from home or have to work from home. And so instead of working from home and having an extra entire bedroom and paying for that bedroom, they're using one of these offices as a place to, to work during the day. And instead of then having you know a, a one bedroom with an office, which would then be a two bedroom, they could still go with a one bedroom and pay uh, whatever they're paying to use these offices. Uh, uh, by the day or by the hour, however it works, but it works out better. So we're, we're going to see completely re repositioning of, of real estate. WeWorks, for example. Uh, Ken, you want to talk a little bit about what WeWorks is doing? Because I mean, they're repositioning how, they, how they're how they renting out their, their, their office space, you know, for, uh, for folks. Well, I, I think the WeWork model, uh, as it was formed, uh, we all know it was a bit of a, a smoke and mirrors uh, scenario. But the concept of co-working is here to stay. And I, I predict that more corporate occupiers are going to uh, shift more into that shared office environment. And as many people are more 1099 as opposed to being full employees of the various enterprises that they work for, you will see that demand for co-working environments where they lease you a desk by the day or by the week or by the month. 
and you can come and go and the long-term commitments to office space that the whole industry has been built on is going to have to change. Most of the occupiers I'm working with now are looking to downsize anywhere from 15 to 30 percent. And they're all at this time because of uncertainties related to the economy. They don't know uh, how long they should be committing to. So everybody's trying to do a shorter term lease. So I think that's also a paradigm shift in the whole world of office and the way can, office space is utilized. Can I'm sorry, can you address those two? Um, because down here in South Florida, I know we have pockets of the uh, yes, we have the high rise uh, everywhere, Miami, you look at the skyline, Los Olas area, downtown, uh, New York, of course. Um, but what about, uh, what are you seeing in the smaller office space, the single story, the pockets that we have throughout South Florida of the, um, you know, single buildings or, uh, you know, uh, are those still in demand? Because we have heard they still are in that sector. Yeah, they are. In fact, they're more in demand now than ever for a couple of reasons. Number one, you're not going to see in this marketplace in Southeast Florida where land is at a premium, the, the numbers don't make sense to build single story office any longer. The cost of construction in the last year has gone up by at least 25%. I would say it's probably gone up a little bit more. So the cost to, to build these buildings and the cost to build the inside of them it's just skyrocketed. It's now from a shell perspective, it's about 65 to $70 a foot to build an office out. When I started way back in the midst of time, it was $20 and that people thought that was a crazy amount of money. Uh, the single story office product, my office happens to be in a single story building in uh, the Sawgrass International Corporate Park. I haven't had so much demand and activity on this property. I'm pretty much almost fully leased. Every time I get a space that hits the market, it's gone within about four to six weeks with quality, you know, credit worthy tenants that are that want to be here as opposed to being a in a high rise or a mid rise class A tower. Downtown Fort Lauderdale has a 25 percent vacancy rate amongst its class A bandwidth. Same with Sawgrass Corporate Park. There are, you know, there are the class A level of of most submarkets in South Florida are suffering. Downtown Brickell, where they've got some brand new buildings and a lot of the uh, Wall Street firms are moving in, the tech firms are moving in, they're doing a little bit better and their absorption reflects it. But for the most part, negative absorption throughout the office market is what's going on. But the single story product is actually doing really well because people have woken up and said, I don't wanna ride in the elevator with a stranger going up 30 stories. I'd rather be able to go into my own office, park, walk in, walk out, control my own security and safety. So, so Ken, we were talking about, you know, what impact is it really having on rents right now? And what we're seeing, I guess, is A, we're saying that, that people are taking maybe 17% less space because you have this hybrid work model where some people are gonna work from home, some are gonna come in, some never gonna come in, some always wanna come in. And then you have these new businesses coming down that's gonna help, you know, basically take over that space and then we have this phenomenon of leases that are shorter in duration. And then we have leases that uh, when people do renew, that they're getting bigger concessions up front right now, just to keep the rent roll up, but at least to, to keep the spaces filled. So at the end, rents are basically flat. Is that, is that right? Yeah, yeah I, the, the office market hasn't gone over a cliff, and I don't think it will. But I think the new normal for any specific building, assuming it's not functionally obsolescent and doesn't have real problems, with parking or air conditioning or you know the you know the way that the windows are designed and so forth if it's if it's if it's a decent building in a relatively healthy market in a healthy surrounded by good infrastructure and and, and housing the new normal will probably be 85 percent to 88 percent will be fully considered fully leased moving forward i don't see no much can, i don't see much more construction happening in the office market anytime soon. And I do think that a lot of these existing office buildings, class A, class B, are going to morph more towards that, that co-working model. And many of the tenants coming across the transom are looking for shorter term deals. The problem in the office market right now is the tug of war between landlord and tenant on the cost of improvements. And that really hasn't been determined. The shorter the lease term, 
It makes it harder for the landlord to invest in improvements in this market. Tenants are not used to pulling money out of their own pocket and putting it into the build out of their space. So that is going to, we're still, the dance is still going on. We don't know how that's going to play out yet, but it is affecting, you know, deal traffic and velocity. And what's going to affect that are the social dynamics that I want to go over with everyone right now. So first of all, big companies, public companies, Twitter, Square, Spotify are going to be work from home after the pandemic. Why do they do that? Because they can attract uh, a different kind of employee uh, and they can get better value out of that employee because these are employees who may want to work at home, are not suitable and don't want to go to work every day, can't go to work every day. So there, there are a whole bunch, there's a whole class of employees that consider this a perk pre-pandemic to work from home. And post-pandemic, it'll be something that, that some employees may even feel they're entitled to. And so these companies are, are, are banking that they're going to get uh, better and brighter and smarter and better valued employees because of that work from home option. On the well, flip side, go ahead, Ken. Yeah, I, I read a really interesting article this morning uh, that was a study done in the UK of 12,000 different companies. They said the companies that are well run typically do better with their people mostly working out of the house. And it was considered a shock that they weren't pulling them back into the office. They found that their people were more productive. Now, as many people will say that, I'll get you the equal number on the other side, uh, especially at the, uh, the executive level saying, no way, my people are much less productive, you know, unless they're in the office and I can walk, watch them and look at them. However, I think you're right. I think the genie's out of the bottle, whether we like it or not, the hybrid workspace is here. And if we do a little thought experiment, all of us on this Zoom meeting, and we're, we're about to write the check for the rent for this month for our office, and we know that we can save 20 or 30 or 40 percent just by downsizing and reconfiguring. You don't think we're not going to do that? You know, I predict that corporate culture will adapt to the new financial model and the new social model, which will be a hybrid workspace. And that impact will obviously be on the returns you get on the office investment and on the decision to, to build new office, obviously. So it's, it, it's, it's just a, uh, a trickle down impact on. on well, and it also affect the lender market too, because, right. you know, if the majority of your leases are three years in duration, it's going to be very difficult to go to the lender and ask for a 10 year loan, right. um, which, you know, many office leases are seven to 10 years, five to seven, 10 years that, you know, again, we, you and I talked earlier in the week about the FASB rule change. That's another headwind to longer term leases, meaning the elimination of the, the operating lease. Now all leases for not just real estate, but equipment have to be thrown up on the company's balance sheet. So the longer the lease term, the more liability that's shown on the balance sheet. So that is a headwind for longer term leases in the office market. Again, I think the office market will be okay. Right now, people are spending crazy amounts of money uh, on, on buying buildings. In fact, in Weston, uh, the Weston Corporate Center, one of two buildings just traded for $352 a foot. Now that's not a normal number and that doesn't translate across all submarkets and all office buildings. But for a market like Weston, you know, this specific investor felt it was worthy to take the low, low returns to pay that kind of number. On average, you know, probably in the low 200s for class A office is what's generally being paid for suburban office. I won't comment on that deal. <laughs> for obvious reasons. <laughs> um, I, I, I just go back to the slide one second, Lisa. I just want to go over the, the rest of this. I mean, so you, you know, you have these, these technology companies are saying that, you know, we, we're, we're going to only work from home. And then you have banks like JP Morgan that said almost no one's going to work from home, but 10% of the workers may work from home from time to time. It'll probably be more like 20% in that one day a week, you'll be able to work from home. Because if not, those workers will go somewhere else. And, and the employers are just going to learn that real, real fast. And with the tight labor market right now, people want to hang on to their employees. So it'll be you you'd rather let someone work from home one day a week than have to replace that person if they're doing a great job. And then 50% of workers uh, would be willing to work from home at least three days a week. And 34% of employers expect 40% of workers to primarily work from home. So clearly, it's just going to have a major impact on, on, on the square footage of of, of buildings that are rented and how that, that space is, is used and how the money that, that gets saved gets redeployed uh, maybe for uh, em employee welfare or for shareholder benefit. I mean, it's th those funds will just get redeployed one way or the other. 
Next well, thing. Think, think, think about it. I mean, if you're an employee and you have to commute 30 to 45 minutes a day each way to get to and from work, um, you get that time back in your life. Unfortunately, most people throw it right into the work uh, instead of taking it for other things like exercise and, and, and doing for themselves. My controller works three days a week from her residence now since the pandemic started. And I have to email her on the weekend and say, quit working. You know, she's even more productive than before. Um, and I think that that work-life balance is still being worked out, especially for the hybrid workers. And I think it's a to be determined. Jamie Dimon may say, everybody's coming back to the office, but, you know, I think he'll find, like you said, he's not going to be able to make everybody come back to the office. It's just the laws of human, you know, human nature are what they are. So, so the real question is those eureka moments that you sometimes have when people get together and they come up since you know, just organically with an idea or something, either at the water cooler or at lunch or something, are, are companies going to miss those opportunities because people are not getting that? And so Facebook, for example, wants people to get together and they're, and they're not going to have, you know, nine to five, five days a week, but their idea is that they do want people to be in the office a few days a week. So, so there, there is that, that trans. That, that there's a cross pollination of ideas that, that that occurs among 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 humans. So so we have right. a picture here of a Microsoft meeting, and and these people didn't have to commute, uh, they didn't have to fly in, they didn't have to stay at a hotel, and so the carbon footprint of Microsoft is is going to go down, and someday that's going to be very relevant uh, to every company. And so if people aren't having to commute, if you're not having to put them on planes, that reduces your carbon footprint. And that becomes important as we, we, we start to measure that and compare one company to another in terms of what they're doing to, you know, to, to improve uh, this planet. And so that's another factor that's just going to come into play down, down the road. Well, I also think that you know, the, 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 the paradigm of you know, people meeting at the water cooler, uh, it, it may be an old one. Um, the younger generation mostly texts. You know, they don't communicate face to face like you and I did in our generation. And I right. think the way that people will convene as well, now they'll convene in a, in a VR, AR space. Uh, you know, there are AR and VR platforms where you put on a headset and you could meet in a virtual space. This is real technology. It's here now. I've actually done it. And uh, so if you have Zoom fatigue, you put on your, your goggles and before long, they'll be the size of my sunglasses and you know you'll be entering meetings in that regard and meeting with people as avatars so i do think that since bandwidth for the most part in most major cities is pretty high speed and is ubiquitous that this acceleration will continue uh, using technology to convene as opposed to putting someone on a train two hours each way to get to the workspace every day just so they can have their rear end planted in the seat to be seen. Thank you. Let, let's go to the next next uh, page, Lisa, if we could. Okay. Yeah. So we have here, uh, I think these are, uh, may, may even be, um, I'm not sure which companies they are. I think it may be uh, Facebook or Google, I'm not sure. But on the right, we're seeing like these balloon walls. You pump up the, the, this wall and it's, it's full of air. It's there, There's giant plastic bags or giant balloons that you use if you want to make a private phone call and no one can hear you. And so instead of using, you know, construction, you use innovation to create the, uh, the privacy that you're looking for when you need it, uh, and then when you when you don't need it, the wall comes down. And then here we have a picture of a campfire meant to accommodate meetings under the hybrid work model. And here you have uh, again, I think it's, it's either Google or Facebook where they they're reconvene re, re positioning their office space to create this environment where people sit around in a circle. Maybe they're socially distanced, maybe they're not, but it but it creates some sort of, uh, of interaction that that maybe we were talking about that we were missing uh, at the water cooler. Um, so it, it's all innovative and it's really quite, quite fascinating. Uh, Ken, you want to just run these numbers real quick? Yeah, I want to get that inflatable wall. So when I'm watching Sports Center at home on my couch that, you know, it'll, it'll keep me protected from anybody giving me a hard time while I'm watching TV, but I'll work on that. Um, yeah, um, the vacancy rate really hasn't gone uh, up dramatically, although it has ticked up uh, several points in the last year. We're at locally, we're about 13%, but in certain submarkets for class A, meaning the top tier level properties, uh, we're at you know 25% downtown Fort Lauderdale as a brand new building that's being brought online by Styles Corporation. 
that is a giant vacuum cleaner to the rest of the class A buildings in that market as, uh, you know, and as such, the vacancy rates really approaching 24, 25%. Sawgrass International Corporate Park, also class A, there's lots of big wide open floor plate spaces in those class A buildings that are available. So uh, generally the, the asking rate for rent has not gone over a cliff. You know, uh, real estate pricing, rent pricing is very sticky on the way down. Uh, you know, generally uh, office landlords, you know, you have to pry the key from their cold dead hand before they're, they're willing to capitulate on rental rates. You might see, or you are seeing in certain sub markets for certain product, more concessions, more free rent. Uh, the cost of tenant improvements has just gone up dramatically. So the landlords are forced to give bigger TI packages, whether they like it or not. It's still not gonna be enough in many cases to build out the space completely. And then that's where the tug of work that I discussed before comes back into it. Uh, Ken, on, on the next page, you have some noteworthy deals you want to mention. You mentioned the one, the KBS deal, but let's just talk about the other five. Yeah, um, Blackstone, uh, Morgan Stanley, Toma Bravo are all new leases in Miami. Subway Corporation is moving a big chunk of its corporate HQ out of Connecticut down to the airport. Uh, a bunch of buildings in the airport west that I would call a minus product just sold for $203 a foot. Actually a pretty good deal. Um, and that supports my, uh, you know, my, my metrics that most Class A office is selling in that low to mid 200 range per square foot. Um, you know, again, the Western property that's shown, that was 352 a square foot. That's a very unusual deal. Although keep in mind that the land that it's built on is very valuable and the cost to rebuild any of these properties is enormous. So the reconstruction cost just for that structure will be every bit of 300 bucks a foot, if not more. And you should have so, taken the picture of the other building, buddy. Yeah, I guess I should have. Okay. I don't think I took that picture. In fact, you know. <laughs> anyway, um, as an inside joke. Anyway, if, if anyone has any questions, this is probably a good time before because we have about 15 minutes left. Okay, have a particular, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. go ahead. Okay, yeah. we, we'll, keep, we'll keep moving. Yeah, we'll hotels. Moving. Hotels are doing much better here in South Florida than they are elsewhere around the country. Uh, the business hotels are not doing so well. Uh, the tourism hotels are actually doing much better. Their census is close to pre-pandemic levels, obviously, as things open up, uh, you know, as far as vaccinations and so forth, and people feel more comfortable. People want to come to, to South Florida. It is on everybody's radar from California to New York, New Jersey, and elsewhere around the country. If they're not coming here, they're going to Texas, uh, yeah, or Arizona, but for and, the most and, part. And what's really interesting is, you know, normally Miami or South Florida isn't the number one destination in the summer. And this summer, it's it's one of the top destinations for, for, for uh, domestic travel in the United okay. States. And, and the, cruise, the cruise lines say they're opening up. I think they're going to start in, the, in July is what I read, right. that uh, Carnival is going to start. So that, that'll also kickstart uh, the hotels as well. Absolutely. Um, let, let's just talk a little bit about the occupancy rate of, of hotels on the coast and those that are inland. I don't know if we, we if I missed that or if you, if, or if we, yeah, we didn't talk about that. Go ahead. Uh, so I, I forgot what the numbers are, but the hotels that are inland are not doing as well as hotels that are on the water. The hotels that are on the water uh, are close to having an 80 to 90 percent occupancy, and, and inland, you know. The, National average, we said, is forty percent, and then and then Miami, it's fifty-two percent. So it's a big difference if you're if you're literally a hotel that's that's on the coast, uh, on the barrier island, uh, versus you know uh, somewhere in inland uh, near the airport or or in Weston or something like that. Um, okay, next uh, next page twenty. Rentals. Uh, in March, 63% uh, of all short-term rentals were booked in, in South Florida in the winter season and reached up to 83%. Uh, the growth for the past year during the pandemic averaged 7.5%. Uh, there are 21,000 units under construction. Uh, needless to say, uh, rentals are very popular in part because many people are being frozen out of the real estate market because it's gotten so expensive and people can't come up with the down payment and employment hasn't kept up so that people don't have the, the, the income 
to, to make the necessary payments and to meet the, the obligations of, of their banks for, for, for underwriting. Um, and in March, Airbnb had more listings, 5.4 million than Hilton, Marriott, and IHG combined. And it's still not enough. Their biggest concern right now at Airbnb is they need more listings. They have more people who want product than there is product available. And so that kind of tells you uh, how there's this convergence going on between hotel versus residential rental and, or someone who owns it and then, and then rents it out. And so we're, we're seeing a blend and, and a mixture of, of categories now. And we're not saying, well, is this, is this a rental or is this a hotel? And so it's, a, it's really a very interesting phenomenon that, that, that we're seeing. With that, I, I have a question for both of you. Uh, you know, some of the cities limit or have um, numerous restrictions on Airbnb. With the ever-changing market, do you see those being lifted or more um, stringent? I know Key Largo, uh, Key Largo has major restrictions. I know Fort Lauderdale, I mean, some of the major cities just didn't know what you're hearing out there. I mean, not only do the cities have restrictions, but HOA have restrictions, and and uh, you know, co-ops have restrictions. It you know, it creates a sense of transience. So, um, uh, I, I think that you will probably have a fair number of folks that 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 will find restrictions in, in their towns, and then there are other places that that will encourage it. And so, it's just a matter of uh, what the uh, the mentality of that of that community is, and how how they they perceive uh, that kind of government reg regulation. Okay, next screen. Let's see. Okay, right. residential. Um, so residential construction starts have, have increased in South Florida uh, by 40% from March to March, which is unbelievable. Again, it was just right in the middle of the pandemic. The current month's supply uh, is close to historical lows of, of 3.5 3 months. Uh, the number of homes for sale at the end of February 2021 was 29.5% lower than in February 2020. And so here we have the, the crux of it that you, because of work at home, uh, people needed more space. And so they wanted either to get a larger space or people who were coming down from New York or other parts of the country were, were, were buying real estate here that they thought was less expensive than their own market, which was pushing up prices. And so there is a remarkable lack of supply of, of homes right now. And if you're, if any realtors are on the phone, uh, you know, on this call, they know that that the list, you know, getting a listing right now is, is tough. While before it really wasn't as, as hard, it's, it's exceptionally hard to get to get a good listing right now. Um, and so it's a uh, it's 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 a it's a tough play. Ne next slide. So the luxury residential market of all markets probably has seen uh, probably the biggest increase again because of new money that that has been coming down from from New York and also because the luxury market has the luxury of being able typically to work from home. People who are attracted to the luxury market, many of the folks who, who, who buy these homes are working from home. And so they're looking for the extra space and are looking uh, for, for that, that kind of a home. Um, sale prices have increased um, approximately 20% in the luxury market uh, in South Florida in, uh, in the past 12 months. Uh, and sale price for all cash deals have more than doubled as, as well. And so, uh, cash deals are, are usually the, the first deal that a buyer will take, excuse me, a seller will take uh, because it's clean and you, you won't have an appraisal issue. One of the problems that we're seeing as a law firm is that when, when realtors allow their sellers to take a listing and, and then a, a buyer who is going to be subject to a mortgage, that mortgage is going to be subject to an appraisal. And if the property doesn't appraise, unless you have a special provision in, in, the, in the contract, the buyer is able to get out of the contract. And so the seller is then stuck, you know, do I, do I reduce the price or do I move back in if I've already moved out or, you know, what happens if I've already bought another home and I'm planning on, and you get this ripple effect. And so um, it's, it's tough when you're in a market like this when, when, when homes may not appraise. And so for us, that's become a major part of our practice is trying to advise people how to navigate those kinds of, uh, of, of minefields. Uh, Ken, you want to add anything there? Uh, no, I, I just think that, again, you know, the, the luxury residential is the same dynamic uh, on the commercial side. There's just a tremendous amount of money flowing into this market with a limited amount of opportunities to deploy. And uh, as long as that supply demand uh, imbalance continues, uh, you're going to see uh, pricing continue to climb. I don't see it changing anytime soon. 
Um, I do think that we are a, you know, as we said earlier, in a distorted environment, but at least for the next few years, South Florida is really going to be where people want to want to deploy their money uh, amongst for their business and for their residences. Yeah, we got five minutes. I want to plow through here. I'm sorry. Let's go to the next slide. Number 23, investors and other uses. Investors are using luxury real estate to hedge against a rise in inflation. That's always been the case. You know, some people have made money in the stock market. They'll pull it out. They'll buy some real estate. They're expecting inflation to hit up again. Their, their homes will, will be protected and we will be their hedge against inflation. Uh, the other thing is that a lot, there's been a lot of cash out refis. Uh, it's up 49% from 2019. That sometimes is an indication that we're getting uh, into some sort of a bubble, a frothy bubble. Hopefully it won't be anything like like it was in, in 08 during, during the Great Recession, but there was a lot of cash out refinancing that, that kind of signals things. If you can avoid buying a home right now, I would say probably it would be smart because the market's a little high. This is probably a good time to sell. Prices are high. If you, if you could sell and then rent and then buy again, you may be able to time the market, but, but no one knows for sure what, 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 what the future lies. Next, next page. And this is kind of an interesting thing. Delinquencies and rent, uh, there are, uh, Millions and mil millions of people right now who are behind on their rent. I think it's uh, 30 million people, if, if, I, if I heard correctly. Uh, and so that, that's a lot of people who, who owe back rent. Many of them are, are in moratoriums uh, and that are going to expire. Those people will soon be evicted from their homes. Where they go, what we do with those folks, we'll, they'll double up. Hopefully that won't, won't cause a problem for, you know, for the pandemic. Uh, and that was one of the reasons we had it. We couldn't have people doubling up because it would have just made the pandemic that, that much worse. Uh, but 15.6% of, of people are at risk of eviction right now. And uh, landlords um, have been trying to do workouts, but at some point uh, that is going to change and that's going to start to cause a, a, a repercussion of, of sorts. And if we go to the next page 25, uh, we, we see one in 10 homeowners right now are in forbearance. Uh, that means they, they're not paying their mortgage. So either they're going to have to catch up or work out deals with, with their bank. Maybe they were unemployed. Maybe now they're employed again, or maybe the government programs that have been able to help them. But the bottom line is many of those homes will end up in foreclosure in the next five to 10 months. Um, and so by the beginning of next year, we will be in a, in a full uh, foreclosure scenario again, where people will be at the courthouse steps trying to buy good deals. And other folks are going to be hiring firms like ours to try and keep people in their homes, uh, and and uh, we will defend those 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 foreclosures where appropriate. Um, and the bottom line is is that that will have an impact on the increased prices that we're seeing in the housing market, particularly on the luxury end, not on the luxury end, but but below the five hundred thousand dollar mark or maybe six hundred thousand dollar mark, because the number of forbearances are much higher in the uh, moderate home market than in the high-end luxury market. And so that market will be the first market to probably start to not go up as much or, or to uh, even possibly go down. Do we expect anything like we saw in 2008? Absolutely not. If we go to the next page, we'll see uh, that the government is already telling servicers to get ahead of the, the curve here and to do whatever they have to do not to have a crisis like they had la has last, that we had last time. They're telling the servicers to be proactive, provide information to the borrowers, help customers obtain, obtain doc documents, evaluate income fairly, handle inquiries properly, and prevent avoidable foreclosures. And they're telling them that the, the, what they want to do is absolutely avoid the crisis that occurred last time. Having said that, they're almost telling you there is going to possibly be a crisis. Just like they told you, don't worry, don't get gas, when you know we had this little gas crisis and what everyone was doing, they were filling up gasoline in plastic bags. I mean, come on. I mean, let, 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 let's get real. So the bottom line is, do I expect there to be a new foreclosure wave? Absolutely. Will that be a good opportunity for investors? Absolutely. Will that have an impact on pricing? Absolutely. Uh, will it be as bad as next time? Hopefully not. Um, okay, boy, we, have, uh, we have good. Oh, we're at the one end. One minute, one minute. Got one minute for questions. Oh my God, let's go. Come on. Lisa, you got a question. Um, why well, I have a question. Uh, this pertains to commercial and residential about insurance. Yes. Um, it really is tied into, I mean, I just received a cancellation on a property I have that's a vacation home. And um, I'm hearing from everyone that it's going up in prices. So both on the commercial side and residential. Any last minute thoughts on uh, how that will affect um, 
pricing or anything with the market? It's going to affect underwriting. I mean, it's going to affect someone's qualification, especially if they're tight, you know, on, on getting that second home or even buying their first home, if they're really tight. I mean, it's going to have that impact. There's no question about it. So, so that will, 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 again, pull people out of the purchase scenario and push them towards the rental scenario. I think what we're going to see more and more of is people not just renting apartments, but renting homes and their entire businesses, some are public, some are just large, uh, that are buying homes and improving them or buying them, building them from scratch and renting them. And they're not flipping and they're not flipping the homes. They are buying homes and they're going to be professionally managed. I think we're going to see more and more of that uh, in the United States like we do in other parts of Europe right now. And I think that's something we all have to look, look out for. Well, I, I wish to thank, I want to thank Roy and Ken uh, today for being our, our featured speakers. You guys did a great job. Thank you so much. And for everybody who take, took time out of their day to participate and join us, um, you know, this is our series, our Bank United webinar series that we've been doing um, all year. Uh, we will continue throughout the year. Um, so please join us again in the future. And with that, um, Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day, everybody. And uh, yes. thank you. And uh, I, a shout out to my father-in-law and to my wife, if you're both still on. <laughs> right. Take care. Thank Bye. you. Thanks, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Great job. Bye. 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 Bye.